Okay, thank you. So uh, yeah, thanks for coming to Gathering Insights from Audio and Data. I am, I am Ryan Bales. Just a quick uh, apology first. Uh, my voice is a little, a little raspy. I did some traveling this week out in New Jersey for a conference, and um, unfortunately, when I travel, sometimes I get a little, uh, little head cold. So hopefully, you can understand me, and we do okay here. But um, I'll do the best I can. So uh, yeah, I'm Ryan. That's me actually in Boston uh, with my lovely wife and kid. Um, I work at a company in Chicago called Dialogue Tech. We have a Cleveland-based office. Uh, I'm the director of analytics. Uh, my team is responsible for uh, processing transcriptions uh, for audio recordings for about a million phone calls a day, give or take. Um, we are trying to look for ways to gather insights from the, from the raw audio data to not have to spend the additional fee to have that transcribed so that we can process the text. So that kind of is some of the driver for some of the research myself and my team have, have been doing. Um, so yeah, I normally hang out in Cleveland, sometimes Chicago. I'm actually going there this week, and uh, I do a little bit of uh, teaching in the Python and data science world in Akron. So why are we here? There's a lot of audio data that our ears hear all the time. Um, in a marketing sense, you, you, your voices interact with a business in lots of ways, from uh, smart speakers to telephone calls to uh, just a pitch um, a salesperson walking down the street or in the local local mall. Um, it's it's a great advantageous thing for a business to have the ability to, to process that data and gather insights as to what their customers are talking about, what kind of questions they're asking, what kind of problems they're having. And not all that's available on Amazon on a, um, on a, on a post you put on an article. Sometimes it's all via voice because some people still like calling up a business and telling them why they don't like their product or why they like their product. So in this talk, we'll dig a little deeper into what is audio data We'll look at a couple of cool tools that I use just about every day to work with it, and then we'll look at some ways to extract features from audio data to take those waveforms and go to actual digital information that we can then further uh, train machine learning models on and do some prediction, do some classification. Uh, then we'll finish up with uh, talking about transcription and about natural language processing. So first, what I always start with in this talk is, is how, how we as humans hear. Um, as an engineer, I, I tend to go back to the root of the problem and, and try to understand um, everything from start to finish. So when you think about the audio that I'm talking right now and what you're hearing, those, um, those sound waves, that uh, change in pressure from me speaking to this microphone is coming into your ear, down your ear canal, into the middle ear, into the far right, the cochlea. Inside the cochlea, there is a little, um, it's like a little snail. And there's a little, little membrane running inside there that um, is called the bas basilar membrane. On that are very, very tiny hair follicles, thousands, literally thousands of them. As the sound waves enter your ear, your ear canal and go through there, they are making it vibrate. Those vibrations of those follicles on your eardrum and your inner ear create uh, electric pulses that then go to your auditory nerve and then up to your brain, and that's how we hear things which I think is fascinating, the, the level of things that have to happen for that to all come together. So you go from how we hear to how computers hear. You look at a chart like this. On the top, we have an analog signal. On the bottom, we have a digital signal. And effectively, we're taking the analog in this microphone from, from my, my sound displacement, from the, from the amount of uh, air I'm moving when I speak, it's picking it up, and then there's some equipment in the back, it looks like, that's taking that uh, data and is sampling it at a given rate, and then picking off the ones and zeros and coming up with the digital signal down below. So we have to get from that analog to, the, to that, um, that digital content. So digging a little deeper into sound waves in general, um, we'll go back to high school physics classes and talk about uh, frequency and amplitude for a, a quick second. So uh, amplitude is literally the displacement and the wave. Um, on the, on the y-axis, the, uh, the taller it is, the louder it is. Hence why when you go buy a nice amplifier for your car or your home system and you amplify the sound, you're literally making the waveform um, taller that you're, that you're sending out over your speakers. And on the right, with wavelength, the higher the frequency, the faster those waves are coming through. And the lower the frequency, the longer the wavelength is and the, and the, the less of them are coming through over time. So talking about sampling, um, this is very critical in getting good quality audio when you're going from analog to digital for two reasons. Number one, talking about um, 
So in this, in this um, blue digital uh, audio analog wave, every moment in time there is a, a digital sample. And there's two different characteristics of digital samples that are important. Number one is the sampling rate. Um, sampling rates vary immensely. Um, the lowest sampling rate I've seen is eight kilohertz. That's actually your standard telephone call. That's the kind of uh, sample rate my team works with all the time. Um, all the way up to 22.5 megahertz. And that's, that's very insane, like, studio quality and above, like, stuff we don't own. Um, but they, they can produce audio at that, that fast of a sampling rate. Um, typically, like I said, you're going to see phone calls at about 8 kilohertz, and, like, typical MP3 CD quality audio is about 44.1 kilohertz in general. So the more samples you can take per second, the higher the sampling rate, the better you can represent that audio signal into a digital format. Secondly is the bit depth. Uh, your options there are normally uh, 8, 16, 24, or 1, 2, and 3 bytes. Um, typically, you're going to see 1 to 2 uh, byte depth, 8 or 16 bits. That is the amount of data you're saving per sample. So the more samples you save per second and the more data you save per sample um, will help you generate uh, better digital audio from your analog, amongst other factors we'll get to in a second. For example, like, like format. Um, sometimes people don't think about this and they jump right to MP3s. MP3s is, a, is, a, is defined as a lossy format. Uh, WAV files in, uh, in general is what uh, my company works with. It's the, it's the rawest, uncompressed, just large audio. It's large, it's, hard, it's, it's expensive to store. It's, you gotta move it around and do stuff with it. It takes some time sometimes. But it is, it is the uncompressed um, audio coming off of, of your equipment. If you need to compress for any reason, I've normally looked at using FLAC. Um, it's a little bit less known of a format, but it, it's, um, it stands for free lossless audio codec. It, um, files get smaller, and it preserves a lot of the audio, and you, there's a lot less loss. So it's a, it's a good one to, to work with. MP3, I've read, can be somewhat 40% lossy. Now, granted, in, in theory, the loss, so a, a human can hear anywhere from, I forget the exact stat, it's like, two, it's like 20 hertz, 20 kilohertz. That is the, the normal human um, auditory range. Um, in theory, they're trying to remove the um, sounds outside of that range when they're compressing it down. But when you're looking at a computer who can hear th that can hear other um, frequencies, that data can be helpful sometimes. So it's kind of a give and take. Um, I always try to err on the side of store all the data as long as you can, and as, as raw as format as you can. Another factor in getting good quality audio is the, ch is the channels and the way you're mixing it down. Um, typically, you'll talk about if you just had the top row, um, that's a, a mono or, or a single channel recording. Um, in this case, this can be looked at as like a standard phone call um, with you and I conversing over the telephone line. Um, you're on the top, I'm on the bottom, and we have two speakers or a dual channel or stereo audio file. You put that um, in a pair of headphones, you're going to hear one person, one channel left, one channel right, le left, right channels. As you know, more concretely, uh, if you have a 5.1 Dolby system at home, if you take a, a DVD or, or Blu-ray cut for 5.1 Blu-ray, uh, for 5.1 Dolby, um, you, you cut the audio out of that, open up that file, you're going to see um, six channels in there. Um, center, left, right, left, right, rear, and you have that one extra mystery channel for the, uh, for the bass. So in general, keeping um, separate speakers on separate channels so you're not having crosstalk is very helpful when you're working with, um, with this data. Sometimes if you're, in a, if you're in a meeting room or something, you can't normally do th things like that. There are um, automated tools that you can use to diarize the audio and separate out speakers, but there is an error rate there. So if you can, at the source, split off in the channels, that is always going to yield your, uh, your better results. So uh, a couple of quick tools that I use all the time. Uh, first one, SOX. Uh, Cross-platform, you can run that in any environment you like. Um, whenever I grab a new, a new piece of audio, first thing I normally do is drop the terminal and, you know, SOX dash dash I and the path to it. And it gives me some very just quick information about it. How many channels I'm working with, what's the sample rate, uh, what's the bit depth, how large is it, and uh, how long is it. And uh, SOX is like, I had a little, little uh, Swiss Army knife there. I, I literally call SOX the Swiss Army knife of audio processing. Like, you can do thousands of things. There are hundreds of, of uh, parameters to pass to that, that little library that, that can do all kinds of cool stuff. Um, If you want to go visual with your, with your audio work, you can use a tool called Audacity. 
Um, this is what I usually get into if I want to do a little deeper dive into the audio. I want to open it up, look at both channels, listen to them, see what, what I'm hearing where, um, see how, you know, how much amplitude I have on the, on the channel and things like that. I'll, I'll dig into this and kind of play with it more. This is also super helpful too because you can, you can also record through Audacity. You can take your mic and you can record if you want to generate audio content for a presentation like this one. It comes in super handy. Um, so there's a couple of quick tools that you can use to, to work with your audio data before writing any code. No code to write yet, you just, you now know like some really cool chips and tricks and you know a couple of quick tools you can install on your laptops to, to just work with audio files. So now we want to write some code and actually get a little deeper, a little under the hood and, and do more than what the out-of-the-box tools give us. So um, we're going to look at taking those audio files we just looked at and talked about and how can we convert them into, so you're going from analog to digital to actually a, a representation that you can train a, a model on and, and use it for prediction. So there's um, four different types of features we're going to look at. First, raw audio, um, then we're we'll looking at a spectrogram, chromogram, and an MFCC. So first, raw audio. Um, this is simply just taking and opening up. This is a five-second WAV file. Uh, it's it's uh, sampled at 44.1 kilohertz. So doing the math, five seconds times 44,100, there are approximately 221,000 samples uh, being plotted here across this piece of audio as you, um, as you go across time. Um, and all that is doing is just telling you, is showing you the amplitude on the, um, um, the raw amplitude, the raw energy on that audio file. Um, this is actually, I think, a recording of me saying, uh, hello world, and then clapping my hands. <laughs> so um, you can see when I smack my hands together, I got a pretty high amplitude there than my normal voice carried. So. So that's the easy one. That you open up the file and just load it into a, an array or whatever it might be, any kind of data structure, and you have just amplitude numbers. Now comes the math. <laughs> and um, you're gonna see in the next three slides, the, the traditional way this normally works out is there's some usage of a, of a, a Fourier transform. And I don't know about you, but I lasted Fourier transforms uh, in college, and um, now I let the computer do it for me. So I'll get into a couple of libraries here in a second that can do this stuff for you. But um, this is a spectrogram. And just visually looking at it, you can kind of see where the audio was from when I presented it before, from the raw audio. What this is doing is um, I'm using a library called Labrosa. We'll get to a little bit of code in a second. And I'm um, Labrosa, when you provide this audio file to it and you say calculate the spectrogram, it is taking um, and sampling over time and running a Fourier transform per window and then it's comparing that to um, the melody frequencies, or, the, or it's, it's doing a difference in pitch, if you will. And that is the, the color you're seeing is how uh, far or near it is to the different pitches in that window. So the next one, very similar, is a, a chromogram. So this is actually using a little bit different um, type of Fourier transform, it's doing a short time Fourier transform over the same windows of data and if you look very closely at some of these um, horizontal blocks, uh, uh, actually vertical blocks, there are 12 of them. Because a, each one is comparing that sound in that space, uh, in that window, across all 12 of the um, standard pitch classes. C, C sharp, um, you know, D, D sharp, uh, et cetera, all along the way. So you can see that the, the darker you're seeing, the closer it is, I believe, and the lighter it is, the further it is from that, that pitch class. And then MFCCs, or MEL Frequency Sepstral Coefficients, that is a very large mouthful. Um, this is one of the harder ones to actually visualize for me, and this is one of the, the more important ones, I'll get to that in a second, but this is actually doing like seven different steps to get through it. So um, like the first two, spectrogram and chromograms, it is taking in windowing over the audio over time, and then it's doing the Fourier transform. Then it's actually taking a log of the powers of everything that comes back from the Fourier transform, mapping that into a different space, and then doing um, an additional Fourier transform across that, and somehow, some way, it comes out with a MSCC that looks something like this. And you can see through all of the visualizations that we're seeing, um, you can see where the audio is in all, all three cases. Um, this is an important one because if you look at all of your uh, speech-to-text engines that you have, um, an MSCC represents a phony. The, the, a very small unit of speech, of sound. Um, so uh, I know the engine that we use, the Dialogue Tech, and a lot of those I've looked at and talked to the engineers on, this 
MSCCs are a very common feature that's used when you're trying to do uh, speech to text and transcription. It's a very important feature to be used across all of those. So, okay. Let's look a little, look a little code around some of that. So I'm gonna do uh, these demos in Jupyter Lab. Um, Jupyter Lab is just a newer version of Jupyter Notebooks. Um, I do a lot of data science work, so I like just working in, in, in notebooks. If you haven't used them before, it's basically just another um, Python, IPython-based IDE that runs in your web browser. Um, I like it because I can do different experiments all along the way. I'll put my data right below things, my visualization, ship it off to a colleague or a friend or a coworker and, and show them what I'm seeing and we can compare notes and talk about it. So uh, the library I'm using here is called Libroso. Um, I've really enjoyed working with this library. I'm using matplotlib to, to, to visualize and, and draw the output. So first things first, it's a very standard one-liner there to load a file with the browser. You're passing in just the path to the audio. And in this case, I'm passing in SR or sample rate equals none because I want the library to figure it out for me. I want this code to be a little more um, reusable across other files that I get. I don't want to just assume a format or a sample rate. I want to calculate it. So out comes two pieces of data. Like I said, my raw audio of my um, uh, amplitudes and then my uh, sample rate of 44.1. Uh, kilohertz. And then a couple lines. Librosa has some very nice display functions you can pass into, leveraging matplotlib. And um, I can generate a plot right below there, the same plot you've, you've already seen. So within like four lines of code, you can load a file, display it, and you can see what the audio looks like right here in your notebook. Very similar for spectrograms. Um, they have a function called mel spectrogram. You're passing in again the raw audio, the sample rate, um, and then some parameters like how far in time you're hopping in between um, uh, how large your windows are, how many mels you're using. Uh, those are actually just basically um, default uh, parameters that I passed in for funsies. And um, then you're mapping those from powers to, to, to decibels and then plotting them down below to get uh, your spectrogram. So a little bit more advanced, a little bit, a little, you know, five more lines of code roughly, but you can get to a spectrogram um, pretty easily using this library and so forth and so, and so on. Same thing for chromograms. There's a, a chroma, uh, short time Fourier transform version, generating this plot, and then MFCC's, um, same thing you're calling the feature to MFCC function to work further with that. So Librosa, uh, I looked at a couple of different libraries when I started doing some research, and, and Librosa was one of the more just easy plug and play, um, very well documented on their website, check out their, um, their GitHub and, and uh, very straightforward, easy to use um, style library. Okay, so now that we know how to get features from our audio data, what can we do with that? So we're gonna do a little example. Um, I love doing Kegels, kegel.com, and doing different um, practice sessions of different data sets. So I found one called the Free Sound Audio, ta audio Tagging Challenge. This um, Kegel has 41 sound classes, like applause, fireworks, gunshots, toasters, things like that. Um, just little sound clips. And they're all labeled, over 9,000 examples. So next what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at some notebooks I put together to explore that data, work with it, and then train a model from it. So first things first, um, when I start working on a data science problem, I want to just start getting data loaded up and working with it. So I'm using, a t um, I'm using pandas, reading in CSVs from Kaggle. And you see that we get basically our, um, our file name, the label, and that very important feature in this data set is that manually verified um, flag. It turns out, after further review, that this uh, 9,000 labels are not all reviewed and, and verified by the curators of the data. So um, we'll get back to that in a second. Uh, but again, just, putting, just printing out different labels, um, the full set of labels and the full examples. I wanted to look a little closer at how many examples are actually manually verified. So I wanted to do a distribution around that. Um, so I, plotted, I, I generated here just, just in counts. That was fun. Wasn't really pretty. I put together a little uh, stacked bar chart and wanted to see like, how, how well this was kind of dispersed. So um, it turns out decently in general, but there's a couple of categories. So it, for, for help here, um, blue is not verified, uh, yellow or orange is verified. 
So some classes like uh, gunshots are all verified. Uh, other classes such as uh, flutes and things, uh, very high percentage of not verified data. So just to kind of weed out any kind of potential issues, um, I decided for, for this demo to at least this ex remove all of the unverified information and just use the, um, the fully verified data set. So once I decided that, it wasn't super complex. I now have 3,700 examples. I just filtered down where many verified equals one and displaying the shape in the first five rows there. The, the thing that I learned early on when I was working with data, data science type problems are you can, when you're doing your different experiments, you can generate your test, train, and validate sets randomly as you go. But if you do that every experiment, you're comparing apples to oranges over the course of all of your experimentation. So the first thing I do after I figure out how I want to approach a problem is just write a little bit of code just to split things out and make it clean. So in this example here, I'm taking and using a library called sklearn, and I'm calling a function, a function called uh, train test split. And you can see here I'm passing in uh, test size of 20%, train size 80%. Uh, you can kind of play with those as you wish. And I'm also stratifying by labels. And what that means is that for um, every category, I want to make sure that um, if I have 100 samples, 80 and 20, if I, but if I have 10 samples, I'm not getting over, um, oversaturated by cert, well, one certain category, because then my model might be biased and be leaning that direction. So once I do, I do that, I just simply take my data sets that are in CSVs and split them into two different CSVs based on what the prediction was. I run that one time, so I have a very clean uh, amount of data. And then, at least working with audio data, I found it easier to just once you have figured out how you want to split, test, and train, or validate and train, just to move the files around. Just take a quick second, uh, wait a few minutes for all those files to get processed, quick little for loop, and just loop over top of all your data, and move them to, you get one data set of uh, every category, process every category, split them out into test and train folders. That way you can load them up separately and do different work with them. And you're not trying to remember to do that or forgetting to do that, and your, and your data gets polluted. Just split them out once, and let, let your, it'll, you'll, you'll Pay for it'll pay you back over time, um, and that's this that's this code here is I'm just literally moving the audio files around and echoing out thousands of useless pieces of data. Okay, so now I decided to take a stab at now that I have a train a clean data set split into test and train. I wanted to build a a model around it that I can use to classify um, new examples. So here we're using Labrosa again for visualization, uh, but I also bring in Keras, and I'm using um, Keras and TensorFlow, I'm using Keras as a, as a wrapper around TensorFlow to make it a little bit easier on myself. And um, let's take a look. So we've gone through all this. We don't have to, we don't have to skip, skip through all the, visual, all the visualization stuff again. Um, the biggest, most important thing is that my function to, get extra, uh, to extract features is simply just calling um, labrosa.load and labrosa.getmscs. So I'm literally looping over my data set and calculating the MSCCs and storing those in a uh, pandas data frame to then use for, for training. So I process every file I have, calling that function, and now I have features. I also then, you can't pass strings to a model. You, you gotta pass numbers. So I used a, a tool in sklearn called a, a label encoder to actually just take my list of strings and encode them down to effectively their uh, offsets into the array, if you will. And then those are now my, my Y, and I have my X. Now I can train. Uh, quick tip, at this point, save data. Um, notebooks crash, uh, you start training on GPUs, you can tie things up, things go really sideways, you got a power cycle, your machine sometimes, it gets gnarly in some cases. Um, a quick just numpy.save, dump them all to numpy files, and um, you know, your labels, your features, your X, your Y, just, just have it around. That way, if it goes sideways, you don't have to go run that data, that, that those other code that might take a half an hour to run. You can start over from that location. Okay, um, model training. This is six lines of code. Uh, in this case, I'm using a, an LSTM style model, a, a long short-term memory neural network. Um, starting off here, f when I'm using Keras, I'm defining a sequential model, and then I'm doing batch normalization on the first, on the first um, layer. What that means is that across every batch, not only did I tell it to stratify across labels when I split, when I come to do my, um, for each batch of my data processes, it's gonna try its best to normalize within that batch. 
So I'm not training batches that are heavily weighted towards one or two categories. It's going to take and say, okay, I have 40 categories. The most I have here is eight in this category. Um, so I'm going to chop off the rest and take a random sample of eight from the other categories so that I'm, a, I'm about even. It won't be exactly eight, but they'll try to even out as best they can. Then I'm going through two LSTM uh, layers, coming out into a dense layer with a softmax activation, and then uh, from there, uh, compiling my model. And you can see it just rocking through 50 iterations. I trained this on, a, um, on this MacBook in front of me. It took forever, and um, I could probably do much better uh, performance-wise on the data if I had used my GPU that I now have or other, other pieces of data. So, Additionally, you can do model.summary. This is a really cool way to kind of check what, the, what Keras built for you and what kind of model you're running with. And again, that save the disk is super important. Okay, um, we trained the models at work. We gotta, we gotta test it. So I just simply hard-coded up uh, a file from the validation set, this base drum uh, uh, wave file. And I'm calling the same git mfccs from it and then uh, calling, mod now I'm calling, I called model.compile, model build. Now I'm calling model.predict, because I have a model I've, I've built that I want to predict on a new example. So I'm calling model.predict on the MSCCs from that new file, and I get that. That doesn't say base drum. What that is, is it is uh, the array of probabilities per class. So um, to get from that to an actual class, I'm using NumPy and just calling the argmax function just to pick the largest probability. And then I'm just indexing back into my classes um, uh, label encoder to get back base drum, and it worked. Just worked. Great. Thank you. Uh, but wait, there's more. Uh, <laughs> um, so I worked on that one file. I was happy. I never assumed it works on all the files. I have to go test them more now. So now I go process my entire data set, <clears throat> and I run them all through here. And I got three out of five on my first five I took, took a look at. So that's, that's OK. That's pretty good. I'll take it. Um, finally, I, I took a look at the F1 scores, so the, the um, uh, harmonic mean between uh, precision and recall, what I got right, what I got wrong. And I usually look at it by category. Uh, you can look at this in total, and you're getting 0 0.61, 0 0.62. I probably could have trained a little bit more and got it up to like in the sevens. Uh, maybe clean the model up a little bit, played around with some different features, and done a little more with that. But what's interesting is that you can see that like hi-hats, doing great. Um, things like computer keyboards, I guess they didn't have enough clicky com computer keyboards in this data set, I, I can't tell what a computer keyboard is. So just, it's working pretty well. Um, there's lots more we can do to make this better, but for now it's definitely, um, it's a predictive model that can classify new sounds. So, cool. Okay, so that's our modeling. Let's shift gears out of the audio space and talk about what we can, actually, hold on a second. Um, so yeah, we got around 0.6. Um, we know some categories did more or less. We only did 50 epochs. We could have done 1,000 epochs, or 200 epochs, and done more. Uh, we could have let it run on a GPU, so we could have, this took like all night to run. I set it, went to sleep, got it back up, and it was still running. So um, there's a fair amount of data, even at 9,000 samples. Um, and maybe we could have used different network architectures and LSPMs to, to do some, uh, to get a little better quality of our of our predictive results. So let's shift out of audio data for the time we have left. And let's talk about um, transcribing the data to the text and what we can do with the text. So depending on your use case, um, there are lots of options for uh, how you transcribe data. First off, you want to use high quality equipment. If you have the ability to manage your equipment as high quality as you possibly can. All the things we talked about uh, 20 minutes ago, uh, single speaker per channel, Higher sampling, higher sampling rate you can possibly get to, those, um, you know, deep bit depths, things like that, those are all hold true. Um, but sometimes, you're working off of this, and you have zero control over it. Um, you have zero control if there's kids in the background screaming or if somebody's uh, at a stoplight with their music blaring, you have no idea. So, um, wherever you can control your environment, do, but you have to assume you not always can. Um, so, depending on what you're looking to do, there are lots of different options here. Um, all of the major cloud vendors have really good engines. Um, at Dialog Tech, we use a company called Nuance. Um, they don't have a cloud offering per se, but they have a system that we have installed. Um, I say on-prem, but it's in our, our own cloud, but um, in, in AWS. But AWS, Google, uh, 
Azure and IBM, my team has tested all of them. They all test out very, very well, very near state of the art. Um, if I had to pick a horse in the race, Amazon uh, fared a little bit better than some. Google dropped a model, um, a, a text-to-speech model, actually, sorry, speech-to-text model in March, uh, like their V2 model, which got better than all the other ones. So they're probably state of the art as far as uh, word error rate goes right now. Okay, so a quick demo on transcription. Transcription is actually super easy. Um, So for this demo, I went out and I wanted to get some large audio files. Um, I didn't want to, I, I broke my own rules. I'm using MP3s, many, many speakers on one file. It's all I could find. Uh, but I used the, our, our debates from the 2016 uh, presidential election cycle. So I downloaded all the, the MP3s and AWS makes it super straightforward and easy to actually transcribe everything. So um, here's all the data about the raw audio. We can skip over all this. We know how MCCs work. Chromograms. So first step, you make a bucket in S3, upload the file to it. That's all this code is doing. It's just using uh, Boto3, uh, the Python library Boto3, to upload my file directly to my new uh, S3 location. When that's done, uh, using Boto3, I'm instantiating a transcription client, and I'm telling it right here to start a transcription job. I'm just telling it, here's the path to my file, here's what the file is, it's an MP3, here's where I want you to put the results. You can do callbacks so you can be notified about it when it's done. You can do all kinds of fancy stuff. I chose not to. Um, but when it's done, you just go grab it from S3. And when you get your data back, you end up with something like this. So you get a large object with your full transcript. But then you also can go further into the transcript at the item level, and you can dig into each word. And if you're trying to do any kind of uh, conversational modeling and figure out like, if you want to model based on you and I conversing together versus a whole blob of text, um, this is super helpful for you to know that I spoke from one second to two seconds and you spoke from three to four and whatever else it might be. That way you can kind of line everything up and, and, um, and process it that way. So now that we have this information, what can we do with it? So first thing we can do is just look for keywords. What was said in on this, these, these, uh, these debates? So here I'm bringing in my final tool. Actually, I have two more tools. Um, this is Gensum. Uh, Gensum is a, a NLP library um, available in the Python space. Um, in this case, I'm just simply loading up my uh, JSON results and parsing out the transcript. I'm doing some, some pre-processing. I'm removing stop words, uh, um, the, uh, things like that. And then Gensum has a really nice summarization process where you can just summarize the keywords that were used in this, in this debate. I'm also telling it to lemmatize the words. So quick note before we get into all this stuff. There is um, um, lemmatization, and there is um, stemming. Thank you. Thanks. I was totally blanked. Um, the key difference there is that when you're doing stemming, a stem of certain words can actually be a non-English word. It is not in the actual dictionary. When you're, when you're using lemmatization, you are actually essentially stemming, but you are stopping at a full English word. You never go into the like weird, not part of the dictionary words. So, just the thanks for the thanks for the assist. My, my brain went totally shut down there a second. Um, so in this case, once we do all the cleansing and pull everything up, I'm looking at the first 20 keywords. We're talking about taxes and Americans and Donald and businesses. Um, but then also conversely, it's cool to look at what's not what's not talked about. What are some of the least used words? Um, murder. Um, Private, I thought emails were somewhere too, but I, I digress. Okay, um, so that's just a very quick and straightforward, just I wanna just get a summary of keywords being used in this conversation. And um, then additionally, you can do like a keyword search uh, using very similar techniques. So in this case, I'm loading up all my transcripts and I'm doing these steps to them. Similar as before, I'm, um, I'm actually going to sentences. I'm taking, every, all, I'm taking my full transcript and, go, and going uh, down to an array of sentences. In every sentence, I'm looping over it, removing those stop words again. This time, I'm just stemming, not, not lemmatizing. I decided to pull up punctuation and pull out white spaces. That leaves me with a list of my, my clean sentences. Then I want to look for the word taxes. 
And the key here is that you have to do the same processing to your search term that you do your actual um, texture searching through, your corpus. So I'm running those same five things over the search phrase, and you can see I come back with the word text, because that is the stem of texts, so that checks out. Then in this case, I'm just looping over every document and doing a search in that document for the phrase. And in all four debates, we saw about 35 to 40 uh, mentions of the word taxes. Um, except for the VP debate, we had 25. So again, you can look for any st phrases, lots of, you know, you can do a lot of cool searching through here just with very basic stuff. Okay, two more things. We're down to our last 10 minutes. Uh, topic modeling. So again, here we're using Gensum. Topic modeling is, in general, a unsupervised way of processing your text and looking for uh, what topics, what salient topics are being spoken about um, in that conversation. So in here, I'm using uh, Gensum. I'm also pulling a library called Spacey to do some um, stemming. And I'm using a, cool, a tool called PyLDAViz. So I'm generating an, an LDA, a latent Dirichlet allocation topic model, over the corpus of data. And if, we're falling a little behind time here, but these are all these notebooks are all available online. Look at the end. Uh, we're going to skip through a little bit of this, and um, we're doing very very similar things here. We're pre-processing, we're moving stop words, we're cleaning up documents. A lot of this is just the same stuff, you know, same day, different dollar. So, in here, we're actually taking our data and passing in our corpus, and we're building our, our LDA model, and then we're just printing topics, and that really does nothing for anybody because you're giving you some words and some some probabilities. But when looking at this, looking at this I, want, I really wanted to find a way to show this to people and, and let them understand it. I found this really cool tool called PyLDAViz. And what it's doing is it's giving you um, a bubble chart, like, a, like a, a scatter plot of your different topics. And in this case, for whatever reason, um, there is one topic that is very heavily discussed across this entire corpus of data. The other five uh, topics that I have are really minorly talked about. But um, when I click on each bubble, it's showing me the words that were spoken about in that topic. Um, so in this case, it was things like American, president, uh, country, Clinton, secretary, et cetera. And you can loop through, um, you can go through all the topics here and kind of bounce around through them and see the results. So this is helpful if you want to do some modeling on this text because you can do some analysis and you can kind of play with five topics, 10 topics. You can see how um, discernible they are and how, how um, salient and separate they are. If you see a lot of overlap, these bubbles are very much overlapping, it could be harder to do a model on them and tease out the topics being spoken about. Maybe you want to merge those together or work further with those. And finally, we'll talk about sentiment analysis. Um, you may also want to know if someone is mad or angry or bored or upset um, by looking at some of the text that they were talking about. Different, different. Um, there's different ways to do this, both on audio and text data, but for this demonstration, um, we're going to work out the text. So I have two different examples. Um, one, I'm pulling in a library called NLTK, Natural Language Toolkit. There is an algorithm inside of it called the Vader algorithm. Um, we're using this to um, process the debates and um, look for the sentiment of... So we're looking for positive, neutral, and negative. We're trying to see... In this case, we're going through every sentence, and we're cleaning up again, we're tokenizing it, and we are looking at every single sentence and we're trying to see what is the average um, positive, neutral, negative score per, per, um, per sentence. So I make a little object here of all the different scores. I'm looping over every single one and predicting, um, calculating the sentiment score and adding it to my list. And you can see that for, for Vader, we look like we're favoring very much in the, just pretty neutral, pretty neutral a little bit towards the positive side of things. Um, comparatively, most major cloud providers, I know Google has their NLP um, uh, APIs, Amazon has their Comprehend API, they call it. The only downfall that I see with this one, and I'm sure they're going to fix it at some point, is that it's, it's limited to five, um, 5K bytes of data, so 5,000 characters being passed up. So again, calling the library, we're using Boto3, um, and because I'm limited on texture, I decided to do like a beginning-ending kind of comparison. So at the beginning of debate uh, one, um, it's looking pretty neutral, kind of saying hello, greeting people, things like that, and the first 5,000 characters being spoken. But at the end, by the time we get down to, to brass tacks, we get negative. Um, our negative score goes up to um, uh, 0.46. So there's some, there's some muzzling going on. OK. Skipping over these. 
we took a look at analog and digital audio features, um, f uh, characteristics, then how we get features from them, then how we actually train a model from them, and how we transcribe and then do some very basic NLP. Um, everything's posted online at this link. That's how you get a hold of me. Thanks for your time and appreciate it. Have a good day. If anybody